Great. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we are going to start our um, Art Soundscape Seminar Series, the new uh, seminar of our, our Art Soundscape uh, Seminar Series, which is included in the International Year of Sound 2020-2021. And um, let me go to my PowerPoint. This is a seminar series uh, of this, uh, the project Art Soundscapes, ERC project Art Soundscapes. You have the web page um, there if you want to um, check what we do, who we are. But basically, we have several research lines um, based on the study of rock art sound and uh, the connection of everything of all these of these two elements with uh, the sacred. We have um, the characterization of acoustic properties of rock art landscapes. We have another research line on psychoacoustics, then neuroacoustics. We have um, we check the ethnographic and ethnohistorical sources. That would be our fourth research line. And we have a, a fifth research line that is sort of putting everything together and trying to make to make um, sense of it all. Um, we have this seminar series uh, that today uh, will be um, our in, invitee is uh, David Robinson from the University of Len Central Central Lancashire who will be talking about uh, the voice of the world sonic ontologies in native California. Um, David is an archaeologist who has specialized in the art and archaeology of native California. He has also worked in other parts of the world, but I, I think that it is fair to say that his main um, specialization is native California. And he does this in the context of also working with um, local tribal communities. Um, so he has a very clear, and I think that's going to be seen in the uh, seminar today, how he connects, he works together with the tribal communities in the area. And he has a liking of all these new technologies, and I think we will we will also see some of this in this seminar, uh, the use of innovative virtual reality, immersive platforms, and other uh, things, uh, similar things. And he has a huge amount of publications um, that are related somehow with what he's going to be talking about in so rock art, landscape indigenous perception in South Central California in the Schumer's territory. And he has been working in two or in several places, a Pinwheel Cave and Plato Cave, I think that will be two sites that we will hear about today. And today he will be talking about sound, hearing, voice, ontology, South Central California, um, with the Tejon um, Indian tribe and Sonic Agency. And I'm delighted to give the floor, the camera, the video, um, to, without further, further ado, to Dave um, Robinson. And uh, so I hope that uh, you will enjoy this um, seminar today. So um, I will stop sharing here. And please, Dave, go ahead and um, tell us all about it. Great, great. Well, thank you, uh, Marga, for inviting me. It's fantastic to be able to talk about uh, the California stuff. Um, yes, let me let me share my screen here and. Hopefully you can see the yes. voice of the world sonic ontologies in native California. Yeah. Yes, perfect. Okay. 
We're hearing a bit, bit of um, feedback here. Kind of interesting. Must be coming from the mic in the photograph. Okay. Uh, well, before I really start on this, I just want to mention that um, this talk uh, I'm doing in honor of uh, Dr. Ian Morley, who was a friend of mine at uh, University of Cambridge when I was there. Um, such a fantastic um, fellow, uh, very gracious, gentle, uh, very sharp intellect. And he did his PhD on um, musical instrumentation in the in Paleolithic when he was in Cambridge and uh, wrote about it extensively over his career. He, he recently passed away. And so I just want to dedicate this to, uh, to Ian. Uh, we miss him. He was a great guy. Um, but his, his work um, is important and continues, um, continues to influence people um, and will in the future. Um, but I want to start. Uh, after that, with an introduction into uh, this landscape, for those of you who haven't been to California. So this is the land of South Central California. This is the Wind Wolves Preserve. It's about 100,000 acres of contiguous landscape in the heart of South Central California, inland from Los Angeles uh, and Santa Barbara. Um, and you can see it's this uh, rolling hills. Uh, these hills are pushed up by the San Andreas Fault from the uh, from the tectonic activity, and you get these uh, classic open oak woodland areas that the native Californians uh, loved so much, as they could um, acquire uh, acorns and other seed foods from those environments. We've been working out here. I've been working out the, this area for uh, about 20 years now. Time, time flies, and we have been heading back into this, uh, into this landscape, uh, investigating whole different um, types of sites, uh, bedrock mortar sites where food was processed, um, cache caves where basketry is, um, was cached, and uh, we were able to recover some of those objects, um, but also, um, um, of course, rock art sites. And you can see this um, fantastic sandstone formation here at the site of Pleito. Um, a lot of the rock art is located on this this sandstone, and it's in these uh, worn out uh, shelters. And you can see the some of the classic uh, Shumash rock paintings located along the drip line in the edge of the cave here at Plato, uh, looking eastward from this um, time lapse shot uh, that was done by Devlin Gandhi and, and Josh Roth as team members. So our project that we've been going, doing out there has been covering all kinds of different aspects uh, of looking at rock art, including uh, more recently applying portable analytical instrumentation to try and analyze the art itself. So Claire Bedford is here uh, with some undergraduate students uh, gathering data for her PhD, which she just completed, which I'm happy to say. And um, we've been creating a, a chemical signature for all the different paints put in, in through uh, superimposition analysis to try and sort of get the, the DNA of the paint through time, if you will. Uh, but you can see this site is spectacular. It's got a really wide color palette, the widest color palette of any site that I know of in the Americas, um, and um, in very intense overpainting, most of it done in a style which is reminiscent of the Shumash, but with influences from the Yokuts and, and other local regional groups. Um, it has these exotic blues and greens, which are extremely rare, uh, oranges, uh, but more, the more common white, uh, black, and then red, of course. And it's, uh, it's, it's beautiful, um, amazing stuff. This is an exceptional site. Not all the sites are, are really of, of this quality. So, but I've really been turning more towards trying to understand, ever since I did my PhD, uh, the perception of Native Californians. And I think it's useful to look at uh, Vivieras de Castro's idea of animism uh, uh, as an ontology which postulates the social character relations between humans and non-humans. And he, he's coined this term perspectivism. And, and as it says here, uh, typically in normal conditions, humans see humans as humans, animals and animals, and spirits, so they exist as spirits. However, he, in what he's talking about, particularly from an Amerindian perspective or from the Amazon, um, South American perspective, uh, animals or predator and predators might see humans as animals because humans could be prey. And to the same extent that animals uh, see humans as spirits or animals as pre predators. 
It's, it's all about the way that the uh, animals um, have a perspective outward into into the world. And in an Amer 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 Amerindian perspective, um, there really is no ontological distinction between people and animals. In a sense, species don't even exist. These are just the outward forms. Animals and people are persons. Are, are persons. Um, and so, so that uh, there's this notion that virtually is always associated with the idea that the manifest form of each species is a mere envelope, a clothing, which conceals the internal human form. And so Ingold, he, he also uh, adopts this perspective, um, and he says uh, we should re regard the animal as a going on rather than seeing them as nouns, seeing them more as, as adjectives and verbs. So not only as a living thing of a certain kind, but as the manifestation of a process of becoming or continuous creation uh, or simply of being alive. So from this perspective, the wolf, for example, is not fundamentally a characteristic or a certain number of characteristics. It's a wolfing. So he's famously said this in some conferences, although he, he's drawn upon other, other researchers. To say that the wolf uh, is a pack animal argues to lose in Qatari, in, of course, in their um, uh, A Thousand Plateaus, is not to suppose that it lives in packs or to uh, enumerate the individuals of which pack is comprised. Rather, it is to say that the wolf is itself a pack. Or in other words, the going on or wolfing uh, of wolfing seen now here and now there in its multiple instantiations. So he likes to speak of animals animaling. Um, and he, and he, he draws upon the idea of uh, Native Alaskans to, to support this idea. And here we can see some of these, these famous masks where the animal form is evident on the outside, uh, in this case an eagle, but when it opens up, you see a human form. And that, that's the person, the person inside. So again, there's this idea that there's a, a persona, a person, uh, a sentient sentience that uh, exists in, in all animals uh, in, in these um, uh, perspectivism sort of approaches. So that is sort of a, a background to some of the where I'm coming from with ontology. Uh, I just want to place where it is that I'm talking about. So I work in this area, this broader region of South Central California. Um, and you see it, uh, it's, it's, it's primarily in uh, that area where the red dot is, which is around the uh, Wind Wolves Preserve. But uh, I do conduct root research across this whole area. It's out in the west coast of the U.S. Now this area, this is, this is a linguistic map. And so you can see the Shumash area is uh, defined here uh, in front for you. Um, uh, but you have neighboring uh, Yokuts, uh, Kawaisu, uh, Katanamuk, and I'll be introducing you to some Katanamuk people uh, in a little while, the Tatapian, the Liklik, uh, and the Fernandeño, and then the Selenian over here. Now, each one of these groups, the Selenian, the Yokuts, Kawaisu, uh, Shumash, uh, and so forth, each one of these groups uh, represents uh, a completely different ling linguistic family, um, with the Shumash being an isolate. So like the Bosk, the Bosk is a, is a linguistic isolate in Europe. The Shumash is a linguistic isolate in uh, North America, unrelated to any other language. Uh, and we think that's because of the uh, original um, um, uh, Paleo-Indians who settled this area never left. Santa Barbara is a very nice area, so they, they stuck around. But they expanded inland into this area here where it says Emigdiano. And that's where I do my research. It's Emigdiano Shumash territory, but they're they're in a, a pluralistic area. They're they're they they intermarry with, and these these are these boundaries shifted and changed through time and were quite permeable. So uh, while while I focus on the Shumash, it's it's within the larger context of all these uh, South Central California native groups. And uh, this is the landscape that's that's basically coterminous with the Emigdiano Shumash. Uh, area, and this is the Wind Wolves Preserve, um, uh, almost 100,000 acres of contiguous landscape, which is great because it allows you to be able to do uh, uh, landscape research in the, in the traditional sense where you can interconnect sites, you can look at groups of sites, and you don't have to worry about um, uh, different landowners interfering with how you want to do your research. So it, it's kind of like, you know, this classic idea of a, of a field laboratory where um, all kinds of different research questions can be addressed. Now, the Windwells Preserve is dedicated to uh, preserving uh, the wildlife. 
and, and in particular, uh, uh, restoring uh, habitats so that endangered and threatened um, species, animal species, uh, can can recuperate, and also interlink the Windwolves Preserve to neighboring uh, landholding entities to create um, corridors of movement for animal animals. And so this is a this is a, a rich yet fragile biotic landscape. But um, and these these are animals that I've encountered. Uh, these are all my photographs from uh, animals that I've encountered out there, including my favorite shot here of, of coyote. But these animals, I should say, these animals though are the primary reason for the wind wolves to exist. If it wasn't for these animals, it wouldn't exist. So the the agency of these animals is is currently uh, are, are sort of the reason behind the existence of the preserve in the first place. And the native Californians certainly recognized uh, animals as people. So that that um, perspectivism that um, that uh, De Castro is talking about in Amerindian context is 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 translatable to this this region. And we know this through uh, the voluminous ethnographic record that exists from this this area. So we got good evidence that comes from a, a whole wide variety of sources where uh, animals are really considered to be uh, different kinds of person. They're, 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 they're persons just like humans are persons. And they're, they're in kin relationships with each other and humans are in kin relationships with them. So there's, there's, a, there's a, a kinship network that goes across the landscape through different animal uh, forms uh, that these also connect to um, uh, to cosmological uh, astronomical elements above the horizon. So everything was really interconnected in these sort of webs of uh, relationships. And also some, some plants were, were considered that way. Not necessarily all plants. For the Shumash datura, which is the, the hallucinogenic plant that um, I recently been talked about quite a bit because of Pingo Cave, that plant was personified as an old woman named Momoi. And uh, old woman Momoi was uh, integral in the beginning of many mythic accounts. So uh, oftentimes she will be uh, washing her hands in a bowl, which we think is analogous to the making of the Tolawachi brew, the hallucinogenic brew that comes from uh, the plant itself. Um, she'll be washing her hands in a bowl, and she'll tell her granddaughter, whatever you do, don't go to that spring because bear will get you. And the granddaughter says, oh, yes, um, grandmother, I will not go there. And, of course, as soon as uh, old woman Momoi turns her back, She's straight off to the spring, and sure enough, the bear kills him. So uh, she's critical to the beginning of many of these, uh, these, these stories. Tobacco also is sometimes personified, um, but not, nothing doesn't have the status as Datura. Uh, and other than that, most, most plants uh, don't have that sort of same description of a, of a persona uh, and level of sentience as animals and Datura and tobacco do. Um, and a lot of this information, though, that it comes through the oral histories of the Shumash uh, help us understand that ontological framework of, of the consideration of sentience in, in other forms besides human. But it's always, it's always told through uh, stories that typically are uh, placed in time. There's a, there's a chronology that uh, the Shumash and, and other um, South Central California um, natives have that uh, is the way that they perceive their ontological uh, temporal framework. And so it starts basically, uh, well, we start now, start with the lived present. We're, you know, this is the time period, like, say, imagine right before European contact, you got native uh, groups, they're, they're living in villages, they have um, uh, uh, interrelationships with other villages, and they're parts of uh, alliance networks, and you know you're you're hanging out in your village, you're having a good time, and uh, sometime sometime in the past, sometime you know beyond your living memory, there was this time of transformation, and in that time of transformation was when humans were made. H humans were made during that time period, and they were made by animals. The animals made them, and but but then but then before that was a whole mythic time period when animals were people. Animals were, were explicitly people. They lived in villages. The eagle was the chief, um, uh, called the Watt. Uh, coyote was a trickster who could be a doctor sometimes. Owls were, were more proper doctors. Prairie falcon was a hunter. And so every animals all had their own roles that, that this was mimicked this. So animals, people that mimicked the lived present. 
with this time of transformation. But if you go back to the very beginning of time uh, in California um, eschatology, you have uh, a time period when the world is just covered with water. So you have the primeval flood. There's no landforms. There's no water. But animals play the critical role in the agency of creating the world. So various different animals and different tribal groups um, uh, penetrate the water, go down to the bottom of the ocean, bring up some mud, and that mud then is brought up and it forms the mountain ranges of California. So in that in that early time period, the the, the waters recede, and then you have the, the framework upon which you know the the animals can then live out their lives in in this um, time when animals were people. And so you get all kinds of crazy stunts occurring just during this time period. Coyote is uh, will be seeing rattlesnake and trying to uh, catch rattlesnake, and he uses magic to try and do that. Oftentimes, tobacco is used as a form of magic um, in in their um, in their escapades with each other. And there's there's a really really rich um, uh, mythological tradition talking about all this stuff. And the rock formations, then. The rock formations are oftentimes um, uh, animals which, which were turned into stone. So, so Coyote, maybe he's, chase, he's chasing a turtle, and Turtle is, in order for Coyote, in order for Turtle to escape Coyote, he turns himself into stone. And there, there he is. There he is, you know, in, to, turned into stone and lasting all those years. Snake might be uh, going through the landscape, and he gets turned into stone. And so a long, sinuous sandstone formation uh, could be considered to be um, snake turned into stone. Um, and and uh, certain animals get, get uh, associated with um, these rock formations, such as prairie falcon, which nests in them. And um, prairie falcon was a, a great hunter in mythic times uh, because of his eyes. And uh, prairie falcon, of course, in reality, is a great hunter. So the, the, the characteristics that animals had in the mythic time were characteristics based upon their actual abilities as real animals. And the, in this case, uh, and prairie falcon is also considered to be a great gambler because of his eyes um, and uh, in, in, in games of skill. And he, in some myths, he loses his eyes gambling. And uh, there's certain certain morals of the story that's told in those those tales. Um, but what's interesting though is that is that uh, Native Americans all have their own uh, spirit guides, and so you might have a uh, prairie falcon as a spirit guide, and prairie falcon would then help you to be a good hunter because he's a good hunter. So so your spirit guides then will have this capability to help you based upon their own sentient agency, their own capabilities that they can, they can perform in reality, then you can kind of draw upon that through your own allegiance with that, that entity. But I'm, I'm sort of jumping ahead there. So animals, an, animals were people, and they were living in these villages doing all kinds of crazy stuff, and then they come along and they decide they're going to make humans, and in this time of transformations, humans are made, and then animals then adopt their current form. So they, they kind of were like humans. They kind of look kind of like humans but were, were uh, animals. Uh, they, and they transform into their current state of, um, of being and then uh, go into their, uh, their local ecosystems. And then people are there. So it's now people are living and animals are now uh, not living in villages but are now living out in the, in the ecosystem. And there, there doesn't seem to be much of a reason for that happening. That just seems to be uh, what... Um, Native Californians um, said happened, and then you enter into a time period of oral history, and this is a, this is a, this is a time period of legends. So you might have uh, uh, legends of uh, of uh, giants who um, fought battles uh, against uh, heroes, um, things like that. Uh, you could have le there's legends of, of massive droughts that happened and so so maybe that there were droughts that occurred when well, we know there were droughts that occurred that then got passed down through multiple generations and so you have this 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 legendary oral history time period and then you have the time period when people can remember so your grandparents can remember your great-grandparents have memories and you, and your your parents have memories and you have a memory and and you you're told stories so your great-grandparents can tell you stories about when they were little and they and and they can kind of tell you stories of what they were told, and so it goes back in time, and it goes back to around here, 
into this time period. And it's all kind of hazy how far back in time it goes. And so, and there's no real future. There's no idea that there's some, you know, uh, the world's going to be destroyed and there's some sort of Armageddon occurring. There's no, there's no end times. This is the, this is the, this is the state of play always. And everything is in relationship to the back. So, so as each generation lives and dies and lives and dies, the past is always like this. There's always this world history, this time of transformation. There's a, when animals were people and the flood myth and the creation of the world. It's, it's always like that. And so time isn't additive. And, and, and there's no way for it to in, you know, because there's not like a written history that, that adds up. And then, and of course, there's the lived present. Okay, and the so the whole ontological structure of native California is based upon that that scheme where the rocks themselves, many of the rocks, are are really the um, petrified remains of once powerful sentient creatures, and so there's sort of this sense that there's still this slumbering agency there, and when you and 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 the the, the rock formations can have really uh, amazing, uh, almost Dali-esque features to them because of the way the wind carves out the uh, and erosion will forces carve out the um, uh, the rock. And this rock here is known by local farmers as the Indian Princess, and that's just what they made up. So even the farmers sometimes personify the rock formations um, that are, are in these regions, and probably the native Californians did with this rock formation as well. But we don't have any written written record of that and so that so that so the so paint itself then is drawing upon that literally they're drawing upon the rock surface you're touch you're touching basically a dead animal a petrified animal on the rock and so that's a really different sort of sense of what's going on than in our in our view where this is you know we understand the uh, geological and the microbial biological processes that might create these rock surfaces and then the painting on that is a painting on rock but that rock may has a really different kind of state of being to it that is a person could be a person to a, to a person uh, to a native california touching that rock so there's there's a real deep intimacy and when you're when you're dealing with something that has its own perspective looking back at you, then there's a certain degree, there's a different kind of relationship that is going on between you as a person and uh, and your environment than in, typically in our Western mindset. And so the Shumash then, they had this idea of Atishwin. So Atishwin is a really interesting idea. It's sort of a a, a squishy term that means uh, an object, it means uh, the power that that object has, and it means the thing that the power uh, originates from. And so this is a really famous uh, necklace that was acquired by uh, an anthropologist in the early 1900s from the Yokuts, and it has um, eagle beaks, and it has all these beads, and there's an abalone shell. This is eagle down um, uh, around, around the neck, and there's there's different there's, uh, there's some parts of a bear in here, and so there's all these different mixed substances, bits of animals that come together, and so these these animals, these bits of animals that come together, then uh, each one of these things in their own right could be an antiswin. But you can combine these atoms when together to make something even more spectacular and more agentive. So, so when you mix substances together, animal parts and things, you are drawing upon the agency of that animal, the animal as, as, a, as an ally to you, um, and then you can um, uh, do almost alchemy. You can create innovative sort of um, um, uh, admixtures, uh, sort of recipes through the way that you, comp you combine these different um, agencies. And so the thing is, the person who owns this, they're the only one who really knows what that is, what that effect is, because it's not so readily obvious. You know, it, it's not so readily obvious to everybody in society exactly what power this object has. But everybody knows it has power, So, but not necessarily what that power is. And so this is what I call the mystique. There's a mystique ideology associated with the way that uh, agency can be played out. And if you align yourself to these different types of um, uh, powerful agencies, then that gives you the ability to be able to uh, sort of wield power in sort of a, a, a 
a um, uh, just by the fact that you have it. You may never actually employ that power, but the fact that you have this um, capability means that you you yourself are a powerful person. However, everybody else has the same opportunity to do that. So there's a certain degree of, of respect that everybody has to give everybody lest you come into trouble through the fact that uh, different agencies can be employed against you. So you got you got you got to be a respectful person in a society like this. Otherwise, you're gonna be in trouble. And when we look at the ethnography about um, places where like rock art is found, um, rock art is typically found, of course, on rock and typically near a water body. And so across central California, you can look at the um, at the places where this stuff is located, and uh, there's typically uh, some sort of sentient being that inhabits these places. So for the Tabata Ball, in every spring, pool, or river, there dwells a spirit who owns that particular body of water. For the Kawaisu, uh, uh, pictographs are supposedly out of bounds, and touching them will quickly lead to disaster, even death. For the Yokuts, people are afraid of some water bodies and associated rock art sites. And for the Chumash, it was said that painting cave should be avoided since looking upon depictions will cause death. So that means that there is that these um, places are inhabited by uh, individual sentient beings that um, uh, uh, may be inimical to you, or they might not be if you comport yourself properly and you and you um, uh, address them well and treat them well then uh, you can you can be there and not be troubled but uh if you do things improperly then you can be uh troubled quite badly um so again it just shows that there's this idea this perspectivism that there's that there's a, a sort of a person there's there's a personality there's a personhood there's a agency to all kind of different aspects of the environment uh including water bodies and and rock formations uh, uh you can see there's, there's there's this sort of fundamental ontology within of the native world now when you look at the rock art then the rock art itself is kind of analogous to that necklace in the sense that uh, one of the things that's really difficult about Chumash rock art is it's often very hard to really clearly identify what the hell you're looking at so here you have what appears to be a bird okay got wings and a tail and, and it's got these three feet so i'm quite happy that's a bird but it's got this pinwheeling head now pinwheel elements are found around um uh, south central california on their own so this is this is this is like a stock motif this pinwheel that exists and is employed in many different ways that's been plonked straight on the head of a bird right and then you have this critter there's this this um uh central figure and he he's got another pinwheel coming out of it but he has all these radial elements that are connected around the sides and so the i call these transmorphic figures now most most archaeologists and anthropologists would call these therianthropic that they're um like humans turning in animals something like that but but we don't know that we we don't know if they're actually that all, we know that this is this is a bird figure and it has this pinwheeling element, but we have no idea if the, if this has anything to do with a human being in any particular state. Um, so so it's it's a transmorph. It's 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 got different elements that come together to form to create its form. It's not one form or another. It's it's trans, and so uh, the transmorphic figures they elide. They bring together different components. That are often stock set um, figures that appear on their own in different areas, and they combine those together. And they can be uh, animals or humans. Anthropomorphic figures can be put in there. Astronomical elements like like uh, potentially stars, um, uh, sometimes plants, not very often, but sometimes a plant. Uh, but some agentive form uh, that can be made into a singular figure, right? And so I think what's going on here is that they're drawing upon the they're 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 making agents. They're they're painting, they're creating these paintings which have their own agency. They have the ability to do things. And by adding on this other element, you're then creating a, a sort of an alchemical reaction. You're creating a way for the 
um, for the painting to have a different kind of effect than it were if it, if it had a different kind of uh, element here. So there's, a, there's an intentional combination that's going on that makes these, these figures have a certain type of um, power. Now you can then, they take this idea and they take it even further into what I call set pieces. So set pieces are uh, where you uh, have uh, the reoccurring um, uh, uh, modular use of stock imagery that's done in really specific ways. And so, and there's there's different set pieces that we've identified in our research across South Central California. And we don't know what it is that they're, that what the power is that they're representing or if there's a mythic narrative. We, we don't know what those are, but we just know that there's there's similarities in the way that they're combining images, imagery together, stock imagery. So so like if you look at this guy here, so he's got this, he's called Blue Boy. He's got this blue gray um, uh, uh, belly and torso. He's got a head up here and he's got these these legs coming up. Looks looks kind of like a bird. Maybe it's a quail. Could be a quail, but he's anthropomorphized. So he's you know he's one of these transmorphic figures. But you see, he's there. Here's more of these pinwheels, just like that. They're now off to the side, and but they're framing him, just below the elbows. Look here at this guy, just below the elbows. The elbows connect to these radial elements which frame him. Here's what looks like you know, his V formation, maybe like geese flying in a starry night. I don't know. Maybe Van Gogh would like that. But here you have these swirls, these two swirls that frame that. And here's another one that has that has uh, the the swirls off to the sides, but in a more discontinuous way. So this this is this is something very purposeful. They're 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 framing their central figures with the use of this particular radial element, and it's a repeated idea that goes all across uh, South Central California. And this is one reason why I don't think it's it's these are uh, um, derivative of a particular shamanic trance experience, because there's a, there's a formula that's going on here. These are formulaic expressions where there's a, there's a relationship that's being expressed that is across time and space at many many sites. So unless everybody's sort of having really really similar hallucinogenic experiences or or shamanic experiences and are replicating the same thing all the time, uh, what you have here is is a, an artistic tradition that uses uh, imagery in a particular way. There's a lot of idiosyncratic individuality in the way that's done, but there's it's, it's, there's a, a, an agency and an affect that is, I think, being played out in the, the use of these paintings. And there's there's ethnographic ideas to support these, where, where paintings are are meant to manipulate reality, and sometimes, you know, almost like um, uh, like voodoo. In, in distances can hurt people can make it rain can heal people so so the paint admixtures and the application on these surfaces then you know what we're seeing here is painting on potentially petrified mythological creatures that have uh sentience and the paint itself derived from its sources which could potentially have its own sort of agent of uh, aspects and then that the paintings themselves then the represent forms then they uh can uh have further sort of illusions of agency to them so the making of art though can be thought of of as being a performative aspect because in in all these instances we have the the residue of the actual event where the painting is created, but we don't have the person there making it, right? But there was a person there making it, and so we're missing that whole element of the human body being involved in that process. And there may be many aspects. There could have been other material culture accoutrements that were involved in these these performances that um, we just don't have. <clears throat> but we do have evidence of uh, per all kinds of different performances in native California, including dancing and singing. And pigment is was used on the body in these uh, these performances. This is actually Bob Batista, a famous uh, Yokuts doctor. And he in, in this painting, he supposedly has detura in the painting itself. So the plant is maybe giving him a very small dosage of the hallucinogens atropine scopolamine as he's performing here. And it may be that it's actually not really penetrating the skin and doing anything, but there's that acknowledgement of the agency of the plant in his in his pigment, in the painting in, in his body. Um, <clears throat> but anyways, so pigment on the body then is used in dances. And 
and the the pigment itself was used to transform your identity into that of whatever the performance was about and oftentimes vast majority of the times when uh, when dances were done the dance itself was about an animal so there might be the blackbird dance or it could be the bear dance uh, the coyote dance Coyote dance was quite rude, but anyways, the the dances them the dance the dancer them, him or herself would then take on the persona of the animal through the dance. The dance itself was a kind of uh, mimicking the uh, the interiority of the animal itself. So you're becoming that animal and expressing the interiority of the animal, right? And the songs that were sung, the the vocalization was uh, a, a point of transformation where the person then enters into sort of a different language that is expressing that of the of the animal that's that's often expressed in these these dances not all dances were about animals i should say so, so, so sometimes there's very different forms of dance but um so songs songs themselves then were intentional acts of transformation that were critical for these ceremonial relationships. They're critical for everybody here to engage within and to become impressed by this whole act of, of dancing. So, so the singing of, of these songs, oftentimes quite loud and repetitive, uh, had this, um, uh, this transformative act upon um, the society itself. And so, we can see that there's um, this idea of sound then being really important in a whole range of different aspects of ceremony, ritual, and um, other aspects of South Central California life. And bull roars are a really good example. So bull roars um, essentially could be thought of as a means to ex exhibit power uh, when they're being used. And for the Shumash, uh, they were used by uh, these characters called the Yontop uh, in their ceremonies. And the Yontop was a, um, an elite cult that, uh, or association that um, was formed by usually the uh, more um, influential members, families in Shumash society. And they, they had their own language. They spoke a, a ritual language in the Yontop. And uh, they had certain brotherhoods that would give them rights to certain um, aspects of society, such like brother, but the Brotherhood of the Tamil was uh, an on top uh, group that would have the rights to be able to use the Tamil canoes. And, so, and they ran all the ceremonies. So all the big fandangos and fiestas and the big um, uh, summer solstice, I'm sorry, winter solstice events, um, uh, morning ceremonies, these large group ceremonies were were operated by the ontop, and so um, and it, everybody would have certain obligations to the ontop, and the ontop then were usually uh, not always but usually these elderly males, and they would position themselves in these ceremonies in advantageous ways so that they would perform to the group and then they would oftentimes get paid for that. So you you'd leave food or money or different things uh, as a way of sort of uh, respecting their authority. And one of the ways that they projected their authority was the use of bull roars. So bull roars um, were often associated with the Paxa, and the Paxa was the master of the ceremony. Um, he, he, also, he could also be the um, go around and be the crier and tell people that they're, that they're going to be having an event. Um, so he was, he was meant to be loud. And, he, and so this, this idea of, of shouting and, and being loud, that um, force that goes into the environment, into the world, the, the sound waves themselves have, have a kind of agency to them. Um, and so in, in one account, Apaxa is using a bull roar and um, deer start scattering and then a earthquake occurs. And so there's this idea that the bull roar is actually causing that earthquake. There's kind of a famous account of uh, of uh, Mount Pinos. Mount Pinos was the center of the Shumash universe, and there's a lot of pine trees up in Mount Pinos, as you all have probably gathered. Um, but the pine groves, which were quite juicy and quite good at the upper elevations, were meant to be uh, off limits 
that this was the this was the sort of the spiritual homeland for the on top was in in the pine uh, trees on top of Mount Pinus. And there's account of one family that decides to go up there and, and get some of those pine nuts because they're so good. And when they're up there, they heard bull roars sounding in the trees, and they they scared and they ran off. And so bull roars then have this uh, capacity to really influence society. And uh, one of the things we were interested in looking at these bull roars is that they often have these notches on the side, like like sawed. And different bull roars have different amounts of notches. Sometimes they're short stretches of notches. Sometimes they don't have notches. Um, and there's, there's these different shapes to the bull roars. And so one of the things we wanted to do was to see if were these – these notches there uh, in order to affect the way it sounded. So um, uh, James Ward, an undergraduate at the time, a uh, student of mine, he worked with Dan McCarthy uh, on this project, and we came up with a research design where um, we created a whole number of these bull roars that standardized shape. So the shape was the same for each one, but then put different notches, different types of notches. And so uh, we, I'll just – Give you a short little clip here to tell you what what we're doing here. Bull roar number one. Take one. We're using Ableton as the digital audio workstation. So we've got six microphones coming in, three condensers, three dynamics. Uh, Dan's going to spin around at the moment, and we're going to record the waveform of it. So that's so whatever you want, Dan. So you see we've got the waveform appearing here. Um, you can drill down and see that a little better. And eventually what I'm going to be doing is dropping a frequency spectrum analyzer onto it so I can actually see what frequencies are being created by the bull roar. Okay, so that was the setup for the um, for the project. Um, and I had more stuff, that I, but I can't share it with you because um, our university was hacked, and so I can't get to my hard drive, my, my storage drive that has that material on it. Um, but essentially what we found was that there was no appreciable difference between the notches. Um, the, there was, there was, so the, the notches do not appear to have been used to manipulate sound. However, however it's, it's really a unique sound. And um, I, we I play another example of one of the bulwars that we created uh, in the field. And what you notice, if you know. If you notice in that particular video, and it was the same thing in the first video, um, the uh, bull roar has a tendency to start flying on, on a low trajectory, and then it flips and goes into a high trajectory, and the sound changes in in those in those changes, and it's it's hard work um, getting a bull roar to go around, and uh, so there's and there's this there is this performative aspect, and it's a very unique sound that it produces. So I'm still curious. I, mean, I haven't been able to find any ethnographic evidence that really talks in detail about about the sound itself, you know, but it's the on top were an esoteric society and they didn't really share any any of their you know their secrets so much to um, anthropologists. So uh, there may have been you know deeper meanings to the flight of the bull roar and the, the way the sound changes uh, when that flight uh, switches. Um, but we, we just don't know that. Um, but certainly the ethnography that we do have shows that boars themselves uh, were considered to be um, um, powerful objects uh, wielded by powerful, powerful people. So, so flutes are another really interesting form um, that, that play an extremely dominant role in, um, in mythological stories. Um, um, I could, uh, there's many different examples that I could pull out. 
Uh, but here's here's one um, one quote from one of the stories that you ought to make things in this place, things that have never been seen before. Then Lizard remembered the words of his friend Coyote, that the sound of his flute brought submission to the world. Another, another quote says that um, uh, the eye of the flute is the pathway of thought. And so we have uh, flutes themselves um, are – they're used a lot by um, – um, the sons of fog and the thunder. So fo fog and the thunder um, uh, have have sexual relations sometimes with Momoi, the the tour plant, and they have and she has children. Sometimes somebody else. And these these children, these um, uh, children of fo fog and thunder, then travel around the world and have all kinds of encounters with um, who are the Nunasis, who are the sort of more malevolent entities in the environment. And um, they they travel with their flutes, and they use their flutes to um, outwit and 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 um, defeat many of their uh, their their enemies. So flutes flutes are ascribed a special status in Shumash lore. Um, and the flute itself is sometimes you know it has its own its own agenda, its, its own kind of way of being. So here's another another quote. Just as the bone whistle knows what it's saying, so the four holes of the flute were the voices of the world. Now the bones, it appears to be that it's, they're typically made from deer bones, not always, but typically. So, so the bone whistle then, and, and there's accounts of the of the whistle being used to uh, communicate with kind of like a supernatural deer uh, that's often associated with springs. And so there are these sort of illusions that go back and forth between different uh, agencies in the environment, with the flute playing a really interesting role. Um, uh, but it could be used sometimes to travel long distances across canyons through the echoing of the flute as they played. So, um, you know, um, Steve Waller has done a lot of research into rock art sites looking at um, uh, the potential of echoes to um, be for where um, the rock art is actually placed. And um, so it happens that we have a site that's placed in what's called Echo Canyon. So, uh, Here's a map of uh, Echo Canyon, um, and there's uh, rock paintings in, on this rock face here and a little bit in a little tiny shelter over here. You got these uh, two intermittent um, seasonal uh, creeks that go through this canyon. Here's a topographic map of it. Um, and and the, the rock art kind of really dominates this pathway. This is a natural pathway through the, uh, through the landscape. The rock art here is is more typical of the rock art in the region than the site of Plato that I showed you earlier. So it has these uh, red circular designs, kind of with these looks like floppy ears coming off of it. Uh, this kind of looks like a beetle with other bits coming off of it. Uh, there's there's black elements. So there's there's basically this bichrome. You have red and black here. There's a large sort of anthropomorphic figure here with horns uh, that's uh, heavily eroded. And um, all this is along this this rock face uh, as you pass through this canyon. Um, and but it's called Echo Canyon. And so um, so as another project, then uh, we decided to go ahead and do some uh, sound analysis of the Echo Canyon. And uh, so James Ward uh, worked with um, um, Josh Roth, Colin Rosemont, and Devlin Gandy. Uh, to record uh, to make recordings at this site and then later on uh, when I talk about Plato, um, but also uh, Jake Hernandez of the Tohon Indian tribe participated, and I'll, I'll be getting to his stuff in, in a little bit. But you can see uh, what microphones are placed in various areas, various distances from the uh, the rock uh, face itself. This is the rock face, and all the paintings are curve along here uh, and go all the way up to this this crevice. Uh, all the way along here. There's, there's a little bit more on the other side. So this this is the big painted area, and it forms this facade. So uh, here's one of the experiments that uh, was done. So a, a number of these were done in different uh, spots across uh, the, in front of the panel, and so uh, the, these are the the reverberations 
of the of the the echo that comes back. Uh, this is uh, from two meters, and this is from five meters from the uh, panel, and this is from ten meters. And what's interesting is I know that uh, Steve Waller has found that in some cases he's been able to identify the precise positioning of rock art elements where uh, the echoes are more uh, most pronounced. Uh, we we this experiment sort of showed something different. The, the, it was echoing at the rock art panel, but the echoes uh, seem to um, uh, become more pronounced as the distance uh, in front of the panel increased. So the further you got away from the panel, when you got more into the center of the canyon, then you got uh, you know really high uh, echoey effects. Um, so you know, whether whether it really matters, if, if, uh, whether that's a real distinction between how people were experiencing that site. Um, it was a windy day when we were there too. And so it may be that the, the wind was uh, messing with things uh, as well. Um, but the, interestingly, the echo, though, seemed to be coming right from across the canyon, coming right back at you. And so there's, there's this idea, idea then again, that when you have these echoes, um, that the, it's, it's the rock is kind of talking back to you, that there's a, a sentient quality to that rock that um, is communicating back to you. You know, almost like in a mocking way, mimicking you, um, or or you could say that you know it's you know there's there's a communication that's going on there um, between some form of sentience. So so the the property of echoes at a site is kind of one of the, the texture of the place itself, and lends to it some of the qualities and characteristics that um, uh, would have been part of defining the kind of of agency that existed in these places. Uh, and then uh, here's another experiment of uh, a sine wave. Echo sine sweep, take two. So, so here's there's three different sine waves were recorded, and there's the three different lines, and 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 there there's there are differences between them, and uh, it th those differences might be and and they're of course we're taken from different distances from the panel, so the differences in sine waves are difficult for us to interpret, and it may be to wind or other inferences, um, or it could be just due to that that change in the distance away from the panel and other, other uh, acoustical properties that have to do with being more in the center of the canyon. Um, yeah, I'd be kind of curious to think if anybody has any ideas about how we can interpret these, these uh, sign sweeps. Um, but also, since we are working with the Tejon tribe and, and um, Jake Hernandez was with us, we, we asked if he Asked for his permission if he would um, do some singing at the sites, and then we could uh, record his his song. And so this is this is a. Uh, I I never really started working with the native Californians until about 2016, and uh, one of the very first things we did was we went to a site called Los Lobos, and uh, Jake sang there, and it uh, I was I was it surprised me how forceful and how awesome it was. So let's listen to Jake for a, a little bit here.
Okay, so that's Jake Hernandez. He's of the uh, um, Katanamuk tribe, and um, uh, we've been given permission to show that today. So I'm, I'm really grateful to um, Jake and to um, his mother, Sandra Hernandez, um, and um, Colin Rambo of the tribe, the cultural resource manager for the tribe, and for them allowing us to be able to listen to that because um, it's, uh, it's it, these are culturally sensitive uh, songs and they did need to be shared in the right way. So it's it's really fantastic that they allowed us to use this. Um, however, when uh, the analysis of of his song showed that there wasn't really the same uh, variability going on in the sign uh, as in the sign suite. So um, uh, I, it it may be they only they only recorded it from two different spots. So uh, we're not quite sure then why we're getting a difference in the sine wave and why we're getting it uh, in the song. But uh, the thing that really gets me is that when these these songs are are made, is you know these sites really really do come alive when uh, you have traditional singing happening in them. So another site then that we looked at was uh, Plato, and this is a site that I highlighted at the beginning that has all the really uh, amazing colors. Um, and it's this uh, low rock shelter that's uh, up on this rock face. And uh, different uh, microphones were, were placed inside the cave as well as outside the cave uh, for our recordings. Um, and this the same – oh, yeah, here we go. Here's a map of the site. There's this plateau on the opposite side where this photograph is taken from. And um, and – there's there's occupation up in that site, so people were living in that area. Um, here you can see this is in the cave. There's a creek coming through. There's another small another rock art loci down here, and lots of bedrock mortars where food is being processed, and a big midden. So these these are now this is a really well inhabited site. Uh, goes back over 2,000 years ago at, at least. So we we got 2,000 years of occupation at this site. Um, yeah. So the, um, the, the echo effect there was far less pronounced than, than at Echo Canyon, which isn't surprising because this place was not called Echo. Um, but although the sound from the balloon pop was too quiet for the microphone to, to detect above the wind, the pop was audible. And then um, the results from inside the cave showed little reverberation. But when positioned across the cave, the balloon pop uh, produced an echo, which seemed to move away from the sound source and along the stream either side of the cave. So you get sound echoing down the canyon al along the stream, uh, uh, along the canyon walls. And so, you know, in terms of the texture and the quality of sound, in terms of the echoes, you know, each site is producing its, its, its own voice. You know, the, 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 the sentient qualities of these sites is speaking in a different way uh, in an auditory sense than, um, than other sites. And again, we, we don't know 
exactly how this was interpreted, except that if we take this idea of ontology and perspectivism, then um, you can see that there's a lot of of, uh, of material here for people to sort of um, engage with uh, and to have relations with uh, at these sites. Uh, when you think of the variability of all of this, of the sense of sound. Um, does the sign sweeps sweeps again were uh, uh, were were a bit more variable than in terms of um, Echo Canyon? Um, but in particular, the, there's a low range that seemed to be quite um, uh, quite fruitful inside the cave, and I'll, I'll, re I'll return to that turn to that in a moment. Um, so when so we had uh, Jake also come and and sing at Plato, and I should say that as far as we know, these are the, these these instances when we went to these sites, uh, which which we recorded, were the, it's the first time. Uh, since the um, early 1800s, potentially, uh, maybe even longer, that uh, Native American singing occurred on these sites. So these these are actually historical doc uh, documents of the revitalization of singing at, at rock art sites in, in this particular part of California. So it's a it's a real it's a real honor to be able to be involved in a project where um, where uh, the, the local native uh, tribe members are coming back to these sites and, and re-engaging with them in in uh, yeah they're it's new but it's it's connected to their to their deeper past so it's it's really really cool stuff let me uh, let me just show you show you this song here thank you all right I need to what are you here Put your head. Put your head, Mr. James. That's, uh, it's all good. So, whenever you're in. No. <clears throat> Okay, so that's that's the first recording ever of a Native American voice at um, Plato Cave. Um, so the um, so the song that was sung by uh, Jake uh, is these are this is um, the sound wave from that, um, and yeah, one of the things that we we found is that there appeared to be a certain sort of uh, sonic quality that emerged from the right side of the cave, um, and so it was noted that the right side of the, of the cave in Plato is an area of cave which, when struck with the hand, makes a dull thud sound. It's it's, it's kind of just it's like the rock slightly hollow underneath, um, and and so there's this resonant quality that comes from it. So the property of the cave that was only discovered accidentally. So it was really hard to really incorporate that into um, James's uh, investigation, but you know, in in our in our work here, we you know we we looked at some of uh, Margarita's work before previously where she talked about lithophones, and I've done work in India um, at the site of uh, Hero to the Hill where the lithophones there. Um, it's possible that there could be um, 
this aspect of the rock was um, being used as a, sort of an instrumentation, but it certainly affected the, uh, the, the sonic quality of the cave itself. Um, and so really what I find just of far greater value in this research um, isn't necessarily trying to determine if people in the past experienced these places or made rock art directly in relationship to uh, you know, the idiosyncratic um, sonic qualities of these landscapes, but the fact that um, they're uh, being re-encountered and reimagined and being brought back to life through the uh, local Native Americans who are coming back into these places. Um, and uh, so working with them, um, I learned so much. And one of the things that's always stuck with me is what Sandra Hernandez told me one day. And uh, this, this isn't a direct quote. This is kind of my, my memory of what she said. She says that whatever you do, be careful what you say. For the wind itself can carry what you say, and somebody then might hear it, uh, and then can tell somebody else. So when you say something, the wind can can carry it, and it can um, the rock might hear it, and the rock might then decide that it will want to tell a bird, or maybe a bird will hear that, or maybe some other animal. But in any case, the whole environment is full of sentient qualities and sentient beings that will understand what you're saying and they can pass that along and then somebody then might hear what you have to say so there's this whole you know societal um, um, reinforcing societal norms through this sort of idea that that there's there is a certain degree of surveillance that occurs in environments even when you're completely on your own um, and the, the sentient quality of everything around you is one way that will encourage you to act with respect to that to that world surrounding you um and so i want to just return a little bit to then to uh, what tim ingold talks about uh when talking about animism um and he he shows that and he says that um typically people in western societies who dream, dream of finding life on other planets um will we'll label indigenous peoples with this kind of uh, animism. Um, and these these peoples are not united are, are united not in their belief, but beliefs. He's saying it's not really about a, a belief system, but more about a way of being. And it's a way of being that is alive and open to the world uh, in its continuous birth. You know, he's he's he really stresses this idea of the continually always coming into being uh, idea of ontology. And so in this an 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 anemic anthology, things do not propel themselves across a ready-made world, but rather issue forth through a world in formation along the lines of their relationships. So um, bringing things alive then is a matter not of adding to them a sprinkling of agency, but of restoring them to the generative fluxes of the world of materials in which they came into being and continue to subsist. Um, this view that things are in life rather than life in things is diametrically opposed to uh, what he says are other ideas of animism, such as by E.B. Taylor and Pels and others, um, which entail the attribution of life, spirit, or agency to objects that are really inert. So he, he kind of takes offense to, to this idea that, that there's a, an inert quality to things and that indigenous peoples are then kind of making up this idea of agency, but rather that their view on their world is a legitimate and valid way of thinking about how it is that the, the world actually operates. And that native belief systems aren't just belief systems. They're, uh, they're ontological um, modes of existence that are attuned to how it is that the world interrelates uh, to them and them to the world in this, uh, in this relational way. And so while there's perspectivism, while there, there is a perspective, you know, a, a coyote has his own perspective to your personhood and you have your own perspective to that, uh, Cody, uh, ontologically speaking, there really is no difference between you and a Cody. You're both you're both legitimate beings that have your own subjective point of view. So, from my perspective, uh, indigenous ontologies that um, the way that they operate is rather than I think, therefore I am in a Western philosophy, it's uh, I relate, therefore we are. 
is more of an indigenous ontology. It has to do with that one cannot exist without the other. You cannot exist without the other. The other cannot exist without you. Agency is within the relationship. Agency isn't imbued within a pair of scissors uh, or, or, or your hand or the, or the paper. Agency is imbued in the fact that all those things come together in the act of it happening. So uh, there's this debate that I have, argument I have with some of my colleagues where you know, only humans have agency, uh, which is just ridiculous because humans don't exist only on their own. But anyways, that's, that's my, own, my own problem. Okay, so I want to finish off here then, uh, wrap it up. Uh, what, what do I see in the sonic ontologies of native California? Um, well, California Indians perceive the world as full of sentience and other forms of agency. And that include plants, animals, minerals, natural phenomenon. All these could be agents with their own perspectives. Uh, material culture can be agents based upon the original agency from which that uh, entity uh, was made. So, like you know, um, uh, a a scaffold saw made from um, a animal then is imbued with the agency of that actual animal. Um, Musical instruments can 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 also seem to operate this way, that the uh, flutes and whistles, which were made from animal parts, seem to relate back to those animals that they that they derive from. Um, rock formations uh, may be the petrified remains of animals from mythic times with a kind of slumbering agency. And rock art itself then could draw upon a wide sense of agencies in an alchemical sense. So the paintings could um, um, have a certain degree of uh, redolent power because of the power of the pigments themselves, um, uh, but also the painting on the rock surface of, um, of petrified mythological creatures itself is, uh, is an engagement with uh, a, a kind of a mythic agency. Um, and then the images themselves, the way that they're drawn and, and, and put together, then uh, multiply those effects, if you will. And going with that, then, the sound properties of the sites may have added different textures of agency to each place. So I don't think we need to search for, like, the holy grail of, of an echo that, that plays itself out in a particular way at 47% of the sites, and that proves, therefore, that that kind of echo is, is what's important. Uh, I think if we, if we think more um, critically and holistically about uh, ontologies and, and the way people uh, uh, come to being in a world, um, it, it, the, the qualities of, of each place can have its own particular um, uh, idiosyncratic aspect, which people uh, could have interpreted and engaged with in, in their own terms uh, based upon how that quality was. Uh, vocalizations by native Californians uh, would have brought their own form of agency into that space. Um, songs then were, were transformative acts that enabled relations to come into being. And contemporary Native Californians are bringing these places back to life in the act of singing. And indeed, these relationships are being um, created through these sorts of engagements, through song, particularly with me and my team and the Katanamuk Indians and, and the Windwills Preserve who owns this place. And, and now with you. You guys have been listening to this. And so you are now... Um, um, recipients of the, the type of agency that the songs can actually purvey. And with that, um, I just want to say uh, this is part of the um, uh, um, part of a large team of different researchers around the world, a um, big international team that we're all working together on different aspects of this project. And uh, I wanted to uh, thank Margarita and the Art Soundscapes Project for inviting me. And a lot, some of this research was funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council in our Unraveling the Gordian Knot project. Um, so with that, I'll just say thank you. And um, I guess I can take some questions if anybody has any. Cheers. Thank you very much, um, Dave. Thank, thanks for um, your talk. I think that um, you can uh, now, um, I think you are sharing the screen, so if you can stop sharing, perhaps then we can see you.
And okay. thank you very much for this um, talk in which we have been going from, you know, from animism, perspectivism, um, to um, the way in which um, the Schumanns look at um, time, the chronology, the mythical time, time of transformation, um, mm. after everything up about the primeval uh, flood. Um, and you have been talking to us about uh, some instruments and and then some experiments that you've been making in different places, Echo Canyon, uh, in Plato, um, and how Jake um, Hernandez, and I'm not sure whether the second one was Jake as well, um, in yeah, Plato it was, yeah. It, it yeah. was, yeah. Um, and and how all these have you have put every, this together with agency? I we don't see you at the moment, so if you can put your screen on, that that would be brilliant. And uh, yeah. um, I forgot to say that uh, uh, that you can use the um, the chat, which is at the bottom of your screen. There's a purple button. Yeah, I see that. There's uh, there's a uh, um, sort of a balloon. You can make your comments there. Although uh, perhaps I will give permission to some of the. I, I can see that now at least the the members of the Arts and Skates project are being given the permission um, to um, to talk. Uh, and I will give to others that I know. But otherwise, please leave your comments in in the chat. So. Go yeah. ahead, whoever wants to talk. Um, the, you, you can see also at the bottom of the screen. Um, um, yes, Raquel, uh, go ahead, Raquel. Share my audio and the video now. Yes, please. Um, Hi, Raquel. Hello. Hello. I cannot see you, but I guess you're there and you can. Uh, hear me well. Thanks a lot for your uh, talk. You've been very, very generous. I'm, I'm, I'm really, really happy I could attend. I'm part of the Art Soundscapes project, but I'm not an expert on native California at all. I'm just a music archaeologist. Mm. So my questions maybe are more archaeological and um, quite focused on musical instruments. So um, I don't know, maybe you are unable to answer them, but I will give it a try. I'm uh, quite interested uh, by, of course, the bull roarers you showed and the flutes. I wonder if they are archaeological finds, though they uh, were, I don't know, expropriated, expropriated by ethnographers and they ended up in uh, ethnographic museums, or they are, I don't know, uh, recent instruments played uh, by the Schumas. Yeah, it's uh, all of the above, all of the above. So um, most mostly there are archaeological finds uh, that come through excavations, um, and but some some have been collected ethnographically um, through various collections, um, and some some are are being are, are pretty brand new, being made by contemporary Shumash people. Okay. So, um, um, and and do, do we know the the chronologies of the excavated one? I mean, how old uh, this tradition? How 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 far away? Back in time, we can go with these instruments. Oh, the, the, the flutes themselves. The um, the bulwarks. I'm, I'm more interested about. That. Oh well, the only the bull roars, There's only about four or five of them that have been found, and uh, they haven't been dated. Okay. So we're we're putting together a project to date. They, they, the bull roars come from cache caves, from caches. Mm -hmm. um, so we're putting together a project to date to date those. So yeah. um, we, we, there's there's very little understanding of the antiquity of bull roars. Okay, so I was I'm I'm, I'm also even guessing what Kaiser Luna, one of the most famous music archaeologists in the world, um, is going to comment. Uh, so maybe Kaiser, I'm going to say for you. But usually in music archaeology, when we find these notches, uh, mm -hmm. we interpret it as as, as possible scrappers. So they, these instruments may have had a double use as scrappers. Okay and uh, bull roars so it's it's not uncommon that this kind uh this kind of instrument you know what well, thank you. what was that Raquel? I, I couldn't hear it properly oops uh, do you do you know what the scrap is the what the the the, uh, the the notches on the side of the burrows are for yeah we do we do not we do not we don't know uh, them They're, 
I was I was saying that in music archaeology, yeah, usually mm -hmm. interpret these kind of notches as possible scrapers or rasps. You know, in instruments yeah. play sounds through the friction of uh, hard material against the notches. Oh, okay. So I yeah. Mean, Maybe Kaisa Lund can, can comment yeah. on that. She's an expert on bull roar. Yeah. Uh, oh, okay. can, you, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes I can. can yeah. Yeah, sorry, because I lost you. I, I lost connection when you asked the question, but uh, uh, I was, uh, um, where are those, uh, or that bull roar, an archaeological find? Yes, yeah. yeah. In in what context did you say in uh, from a from a, a cave a dry cave site a from cache. a cave yeah it's yes. made of wood it's made of wood it looks like yes a wood. yes um, yeah. I, I can tell you that uh, I have myself made uh, experiments with the uh, burrows with and without notches and uh, I have also published that and. Uh, uh, I did not have that uh, refined uh, equipment, but uh, we who carried out those experiments did not hear any difference uh, of the sound with notches, so it's like you say. But amazing, when we use round bus discs, you know, like uh, a round uh, small plate with uh, that you uh, uh, it's a relative to the to the bull roarer and uh, a round round flat disc that you twin between your hands by means uh -huh. of a string. Uh, Sorry, you, you broke up there a little bit. I didn't hear you that. Oh well, she will reconnect. Well, she will yeah. probably have some amazing information. I'm sure about that. Maybe I could go yeah. Yeah. To, uh, until Kai comes back. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Kasha. Sorry, that connection. Uh, the small, the small flat uh, uh, round uh, bus disc, as we say, uh, they they are uh, they have a different sound when uh, when uh, the the edges are uh, notched. So, so I've seen. Cool. Cool. That's good. That's. Uh, uh, I'd like to see. Look at your paper at some point. That would be great. Kaisa, I will. I will give you Dave a contact. So maybe you can okay. send your paper and can explain. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be, that'd be great. great. Yeah. It's it's uh, yeah. Uh, Raquel. My connect. Yeah, I can so see bad. that. No worries. Yeah. I will put you in contact, Kaisa. Right. Um, I was. I, I wanted to ask you something else because, um, of course, in the project we are working in sites all over the world where indigenous people still live and where indigenous people mm -hmm. have the knowledge. Um, and we are always worry about uh, how to deal, of course, with their um, cultural knowledge, their right of uh, secrecy, uh, etc. And uh, we are yeah. especially uh, aware that bulwarers in many many parts. Uh, Bulvores in many parts of the world are uh, are a secret, so they uh, they are used by specialists, and the information on them is not uh, very well known even by by the same, very same members of the community. So because they are yes. for instance. So I wonder. Uh, of course, I see you are very respectful with uh, indigenous people, and you collaborate with them, and you have their permission to use the materials. But to what extent do you think is we could as project go a little bit uh, uh, deeper into, for instance, ethnographical information on bulwarers or studying bulwarers in museums? Would it be uh, too sensitive a subject to go into that? Or do you think uh, it would be possible? How, what, are your, what is your insight on, on this bulwarer um, tradition? Um, I, I, think, I think it's not too sensitive. Um... Uh, because of colonialism and uh, and um, and the suppression of indigenous practices for such a long time, I don't know. Of, I don't know of anybody who's who's still practicing using bull rowers. So um, I think there's 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 uh, the the generation of native uh, Californians that I know now 
are really curious to find out more about their own traditional practices. So they're, they're a lot more amenable to researchers coming in and doing work, as long as it's done in a very respectful way and, you know, it's shared knowledge and things like that um, and co-produced. So, so there's, it's, I think it's a, it's a really good time to do that kind of research. It's very good. Um, and ethnographically, ethnographically, there's, you know, John Peabody Harrington uh, worked for the Smithsonian and he collected um, millions of pages of notes literally, uh, with, the, with the native uh, Californians, and uh, of which only a percentage of that has been published. So there is there's more information that's unpublished in notes that, um, that, that exists. Some of them, um, I, I was not the one leading that part of the project, but we've gone through some of them, and we found things that, of course, we, we need to collaborate with the people in California, because otherwise, sometimes we feel that we have information that maybe was not... Um, gathered in a way aesthetical as we yeah. believe things are done nowadays in ethnographically so uh, we just yeah. try to be sensitive to the budget even if we are very very important for instance uh, in bull and, and such um yeah well, thank we're, you we're friendly in california we, we, we like working with people it's good so that would be great thank you yeah cool great thank you i've been listening hearing sort of perhaps hands ra being raised but i cannot see any anyone here but my connection is not brilliant at the moment so i don't know whether anybody else wants to say anything there's someone who wants to say something i don't know i, I know it's, it's me Marga. oh great go ahead name yes uh, thank you for your talk dave i would like to ask you uh, did you measure any other acoustic parameters besides the uh, besides the echo, like speech clarity or music clarity? Uh, no, no. We, we just did those three. The three experiments that I showed you were the only ones that were performed. Okay. So was, and and did you try to analyze, for example, the acoustic the acoustics of shelters with ultra cards to make a comparison or something like that? I'm sorry. The the, the, the acoustics of what? Uh, of shelters without rock art to make a comparison between uh, sites with rock art and without rock art. No, we did we did not. No, okay. so it was, it was it was literally those those two sites. Okay. So you know, al although they're they're very different different kinds of sites. So the the echo was really more of just a a, a leaning rock face, mm -hmm. uh, which provide very minimal shelter. Um, and then Plato Cave, of course, is a, pr a proper uh, rock shelter. So they're, they're yeah. very different qualities to those places. OK, thank you. You're welcome. Someone else that at the moment. You can head, just could write something in the chat and we will. Yeah, I keep, I keep, I keep trying. <laughs> I can hear you now. I hear you. I can hear you. Can you, yeah. can you hear me now? Yes. 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 OK. Um, I, all the all the indicators say it's working anyway. I uh, wanted to yep. comment on two things. First, on bull roars, uh, if you broaden your your range in California, we have quite a number of ethnographically made bull roars in Southern California. Um, okay. And they actually are quite similar. They tend to be a little larger than yours, and they tend to always have notches. And mm. I've never done any actual research uh, specifically, but. We, as I was a formerly a museum curator where we have these things in collections and we never saw any difference in sound from the notches. It's always a problem of what those notches mean. Uh, yeah. So, but, but, but if you look, I mean, the bull roar is a very ancient and worldwide concept. And so it's not particularly unique. And then there are a lot of uh, ethnographic examples floating around from farther south in the state. And then the second comment was on theory anthropes, and you had mentioned that many anthropologists would use your call your examples theory anthropes, but that really is not the case. Theory anthropes are specifically animal and human conflations uh, from Greek wild animal and the word anthro for human. Mm -hmm. And neither of your two examples had, uh, at least to me, visible characteristics, which would call them theory anthropes. And the blue boy uh, didn't seem to have any animal characteristics, so he also would, at least in our terminology as we understand it, maybe on this side of the pond or whatever you call the Atlantic Ocean. 
Um, okay. Those would not be therianthropes by any definition that I'm familiar with, um, although they certainly would fit your, your other definitions. Okay, good. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy with that. I, I'm not a, I'm not a big fan of that term therianthrope anyways. It's, it's sort of it's sort of late it's laden with the whole uh, uh, sort of Eastern European werewolf connotations. And, well, it, so. that's true. Although I in rock art studies we don't seem to hear much about werewolves. So, but, <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> but it, yeah. but again, but it's important that it's specifically human and animal combinations. Right. And right. hello, Margarita. I'm glad to meet you on screen. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> really nice to see you, to meet you, finally, after so many emails. <laughs> That's great. Right. <laughs> okay, so, thank you. Yeah. But uh, Ken, Ken, I was uh, I was really good friends with Rick Burry, so we, we recently did a... Right, a yeah, that's one of the great tragedies of, of recent times yeah. in our, our world over here, yeah. Yeah, he's yeah. he's sorely missed. He's sorely missed. So, um, right. Anyways, so um, I want to in California for that loss. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna turn my equipment back off again now. <laughs> okay. N nice speaking meeting to you, Ken. Thanks. Same here. Dave, um, I wanted to ask you, you were talking about this mythical time and uh, this time of transformation and so on, but can you see that in the art? Because you haven't made um, any, um, you know, so in, in the way in which the art is depicted or what the art depicts, can you see mm -hmm. that as one can see, for example, in Australia? Um, and, mm -hmm. and also, is there... Are there any connections between these mythical uh, beings with um, sounds in mythology? So, mm. are there? Um, so, there are two questions really, two different ones. One is about rock art, yeah. and then um, the the second is sound. Well, the first one is is is, is it's very difficult to say um, because of the you know the the. I mean, you have very odd-looking imagery in Shumash. It's, it's, it's famous for sort of being fantastical and whimsical, and um, but then when you do have like, like there's some images of turtle that that show up really well, and, and so, sometimes you do have there's there's a particular way that coyote appears to be drawn, um, which I don't know maybe Ken Ken would have something to say about whether the, those images like out on the Creaso plane are actually coyote or not. So there's there are images. Um, and, and and there's images sometimes of, of bear that they they are somewhat anthropomorphized, and so it it could be that one of the reasons why these animals are not depicted in in what we would consider from a Western perspective a naturalized you know uh, way, uh, is that they're 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 representing them as as mythic characters. So it's possible, but it's it's extremely difficult to be able to hang your hat on that and say with any certainty that that's the case. Um, um, and a as for sounds, that's a really good question. Um, a lot of like the Chumash have this this whole class of beings called the Nunasis, and they 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 do make sounds sometimes, but it's it's more like it's like yelling and screaming, and and, uh, um, and then they, they speak you know proper Chumash. So I haven't come across particular sounds associated with. Um, with particular uh, mythological characters, you, you do get um, water babies in in uh, other areas of South Central California, and there are some accounts of them like crying, making crying noises at at like ponds and rock art sites and things like that. Um, so, but I haven't really I haven't really looked through the ethnography specifically for that. So that there could be there could be more there, uh, awaiting discovery. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that we are trying now to do is to connect uh, particular iconographies or um, with with sounds. Um, yeah. So I wonder whether if there is um, a mythical being represented that has that is associated with a particular sound, whether it would be useful, it would be interesting to check whether those um, sites the sites where this um, this iconography is painted, whether they have chosen 
or the painters chose um, but, um, sites with with uh, with uh, particular acoustics. If you mm. know, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah. That, that I mean that would be really difficult in in this in this California context because of the. Um, I mean, a lot of, like like Plato has so much different iconography there. Yeah. It's so overpainted that it has mm -hmm. it sort of represents all the different you know not all of them but so many different forms, you know. And and I know you want to do work at Rocky Hill. Rocky Hill has so many different um, uh, paintings there yeah. uh, that uh, it would be, you know, you you would kind of need to find a site that had less paintings that would then have the painting that you're looking for, I suppose. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. That's, I'll have to think about that. That's, mm -hmm. that's a really interesting research question. I like that. It's good. Yeah. Thank you. Hmm. Great. I think that there are no uh, further questions. Um, if I'm not um, wrong, then perhaps we could um, we could stop here. Or, uh, Raquel, Raquel, go ahead. A, a very quick question, and it's also about the chronology of the work art. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. really. Uh, don't know much about it, but I, I would like to know uh, which updates or if uh, it's still made or not, or if it's historical times or colonial times. Or... Yeah. Um, so, so the, the tradition of making uh, making rock art is pretty much ended. Uh, there are there are some places where some people go back and make them, but it's extremely rare. Um, <clears throat> the chronology. Um, so it's it's. Very little direct dating of any rock art elements in, in South Central California have happened. And the ones that have have, have been very uh, sketchily done, so they come up like about a thousand years ago. Um, uh, excavations at a site called Swordfish Cave has come up with uh, pigment in the deposits uh, and covered petroglyphs that dates back to over 3,000 years BC. So in what's called the, the early period in California. Um, and uh, we have superimposition at sites like Plato um, that um, clearly indicate um, periods of painting being made. And then there's like an oxalate crust that forms over the painting and you get rock fall and then more paintings are made. So there's a deep end, there's a certain antiquity to this stuff. And, we, and we've, we've dated some of these sites, the archaeology associated with it. And, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, evidence that seems to suggest that a lot of these rock art sites date to about 2,000, 2,400 years ago, um, and so it. I mean, it's 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 all very um, uh, with, without direct dating of the painting themselves. It's, it's always you know guilt by association, uh, and you can date the deposits and d d date the rock, the pigment in the deposits, but then you know paints used for different purposes, and there's no guarantee that that's directly related to the production of the rock art. Um, but I'm pretty, I'm pretty well convinced, you know, from uh, the work that's been done out on the Carrizo Plain and on places like Swordfish Cave and in, in my landscape, that uh, there was a, a, a sort of a big time happening of rock art making uh, in what's called the Middle Period in California, which starts at about three, four hundred BC and continues uh, up until the me medieval climatic anomaly uh, when things dry up and life gets a bit difficult. And then there's a, a sort of renewed vigor in rock art making that happens. Uh, starting at about uh, 1200 AD and continues up until European contact. You do get like uh, contact rock art. So we, we the horses appear, uh, Spanish riding horses, um, potentially uh, cattle raiding scenes. So we know uh, rock art was, was being made at the time of European contact. Um, but the, the antiquity of it is, is it's, it's another project that's waiting to happen. <laughs> yes. Brilliant. Thanks a lot. Yeah, you're welcome. So, yes, thank you very much, um, Dave. It has been a very interesting um, uh, talk and we have learned um, a lot. And I'm sure that there are, there are still many, many things to do regarding um, the acoustics, knowing a bit more about the acoustics of places. And, um, you know, there's um, a whole avenue there to, of um, a new project, really, to, to develop that you have a started. But, I can see many, many different things to be done. So um, thank you very much to everybody. And, um, and Dave, yes, thank you.
thank you. Thanks. I appreciate everybody taking time out to, to listen about California stuff. So it's great. And uh, thanks to you and your team for uh, the invite. It's, it's, it's really cool. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. All right. Take care, everybody. Stay safe. Stay safe. Yes. Cheers. Yes. Bye. Bye-bye.